This afternoon, we are going to go over um, the uh, sort of the basics of uh, differential gene expression analysis for RNA-seq data. Note that CBW offers a more in-depth workshop for <clears throat> differential gene expression analysis, RNA-seq analysis. So here we are just going to give you sort of the conceptual overview for how you would start with RNA-seq data. We're assuming it's been processed already, meaning that you've started with the raw read, they've been aligned to the genome, and you've used tools to call uh, counts for gene expression. And, and we are going to use the EDGE-R library to call differentially expressed genes. For this, we're going to make use of the concepts um, that we've uh, been learning all along, uh, notably the GLM concept from this morning. Um, so let's get into it. So at the end of this lecture, you will understand sort of the key steps in identifying differentially expressed genes using RNA sequencing data. Um, you will learn how to use QQ plots. We actually decided the p-value histograms would be too much to gauge how much signal you have after multiple hypothesis testing. Um, we tend to do a lot of multiple hypothesis testing when we do genome-wide um, uh, genome-wide studies, and we are trying to find a signal amidst all our genes. So how do you how do you adjust for that? And then we will create a very um, common visualization called a volcano plot to look at the results of differential expression analysis. So here in a nutshell is the workflow for differential gene expression analysis. You start with a raw expression count matrix. And remember that in, in RNA-seq, you are measuring you know, how many molecules of a particular gene you found in your library. So you get these integer counts and you get this matrix uh, where your rows are your genes or your transcripts um, and your columns are your samples. And, and so this is where we start. And then, you know, we exclude the genes that have a low read count to limit the number of tests we are doing because, um, because of multiple testing burden, we'll talk about that. Then we have to uh, equalize the samples for some sources of technical variation between them. And then finally, we build our statistical model and EDGAR just does this out of the box, but it just helps for you to know what's happening a bit under the hood. We run you know, a gene by gene um, hypothesis test, which is to try to see which of the genes um, expressions is explained by our variable of interest, say, you know, disease, non-disease, responder, non-responder. Um, and then we correct for multiple testing and the genes that survive multiple testing correction, they have an adjusted p-value. You get one for each of your genes. You apply a cutoff and the genes with the adjusted p-value below that cutoff, those are your differentially expressed genes. And then you can go on to look at the signal. You see how many genes have I got? How many are upregulated? How many are downregulated? And then you can go and do fun downstream things like what pathways are these genes in? What else can I say about them? And that is a topic of other courses that are covered um, under the CBW umbrella. Um, so let's start here at the top. When we do RNA-seq analysis, instead of measuring one response variable, we are, we are measuring as many variables as there are genes, right? So those are all of our measures we're looking at. We tend to do this in genomics. If you're doing DNA methylation analysis, you might be measuring anywhere from half a million to uh, half a million, yeah, half a million to almost a million number of measures, right? And at the end of the day, you're looking for what parts of the genome um, seem to have values that can be explained by your factors of interest, okay? So you got 20,000 measures, and at the heart of it, you're doing 20,000 individual statistical tests. So this model that we've conceptually put up here, you're fitting one model per gene, right? And that's why you get, and then the p-value that you get is for your treatment effect, your effect of interest. So you get 20,000 p-value. Now, can somebody define what a p-value is to me? We talk about them all the time. What is a p-value? Yeah. 
So the p value, you guys are all getting getting in that area, but the definition is the p value is the probability that you would see a value as large as the one in your data if there was no effect. Okay, if the null hypothesis is true. So that's probability. It's not the, you know, it's 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 a probability that your effect size would be this large under the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis means you no, know, the treatment effect is zero. Okay. So a p value of 0.05 means there is a 5% chance you would get a value this big if the null hypothesis is true, okay? If there was no effect, if there was no effect, 5% of the time, you would see a value this large. So what happens if you do 100 tests? 5% of the time, you could get a value this large, right? So your p-value of 0 0.05, so if you did 100 tests, and you accepted anything with a p-value of less than 0.05 from your 100 tests, then that p-value is telling you 5% of the time you would get a value like this even if your treatment effect was zero. So <clears throat> this comes from doing something again and again and again, doing the tests over and over again, right? So this is a multiple testing burden. And this is something we deal with when we do a large number of statistical tests, such as happens in genomics, okay? So what do you do with multiple testing burden? You have to limit the number of tests you do, and you need to correct for as many tests of you done. So for example, if I did do 100 tests, then a very conservative way of correcting it is I, I need to take that 5% p-value and I need to divide it by 100 because I did 100 tests, right? And that is a very conservative message of, a method of correction, and it's called the Bonferroni method of correction. So that's what it's very simple. It's very simple mathematically, and it follows from this definition of p-value, um, but it tends to be conservative. So there's there are other methods of correcting, and a very popular method is called Benjamini Hodgeberg correction. Okay, and all we're gonna say is. Um, when you do multiple tests like this, you're going to have a multiple testing burden. And, you know, if you want to answer, ask the question, how many of my genes are differentially expressed? You do not want the uncorrected p-value. You want the corrected or adjusted p-value. Okay. And how do you try to, you know, how do you try to limit this burden? You try to reduce the number of tests you do. And, um, and then you, you know, you do some other things, like there are some tricks built into edge R, right, which we'll go into in a bit. Okay, so one way of reducing multiple testing burden is to remove genes from the tests, which are unlikely to have any effect. For example, if I have a gene that's practically unexpressed in all the samples, I'm just, it's a waste of my time and my multiple testing, whatever, buffer, to test that gene. Right. So one thing we do is it's a heuristic. You say, I'm going to exclude genes that are expressed very, very low. And then what is expressed very low means it's like a field convention, but I'm going to exclude them. So if out of 20,000 of my genes, 5,000 of them aren't expressed very highly, you've lost, um, you've already removed 25% of your tests. Right. So your multiple testing burden is that much less. Okay. So that's. That's why we exclude genes with low read count. Chances are you're going to find a signal in there. You know, um, you'd have to think of a scenario where you could have a low expressing gene, you know, that's so low, you don't even have enough measures and you're still going to see an effect. Can you believe that effect? Could it be, have, could it be sampling variation, right? We do this in other assays as well. So in methylation analysis, when you have close to a million data points, Sometimes you will rank your measures based on their variance. Variance is standard deviation square. And you say, oh, I'm only going to test the top 50% of varying probes. I'm not going to test the others. 
this is sort of a heuristic. Yes, you lose signal, but you know, you kind of try to balance it based on your experimental design. Like if I have only 10 samples, right? Then you're trying to fit this model with 10 data points for a million points, multiple testing issue. How big is your signal gonna be? Is half the genome changing? Or are you expecting one or two genes to change or five, 10 genes to change? Or do you not know? So that's what that's why we exclude genes of Then Then <clears throat> um, remember, try to think about where the counts in that count matrix are coming from. You are sequencing, sampling RNA molecules in your sample, right? And that sampling is going to be variable from sample to sample. Some samples happen to get sequenced a little bit more. Some samples happen to get sequenced a little bit less. Your sequencing assay is not guaranteeing exact same number of total reads coming from a sample. So there's going to be some variation. If, you know, think about it this way. If your controls happen to be sequenced twice as much as your cases, then the RNA counts are just going to look, they're going to be twice as high across the board for all your controls, right? So if you have five molecules in your control, sorry, if you're, what was I saying? Let's say your cases got sequenced twice as much. Okay, let me start over. Suppose in the sequencing, just by chance, a lot of your cases got sequenced a lot more than your controls, say factor of two. Now you look at the RNA count matrix, raw count matrix, then all of your cases have a factor of two compared to your controls. What happens if you don't normalize for that variation? You're gonna call everything a significantly different, right? But it's not real, it's because of variation. So you need to normalize for that. Then you build your statistical model. And at the heart of it, you know, you've got a, a null model, which is expression is just, you know, explained by the intercept plus, you know, some variation. Um, and then you have the full model, which is, no, the expression is a function of, um, you know, the intercept and a function of the disease state, right? This is what we want. This is, these are the genes we want, right? This is a full model. So what RNA-seq, um, you know, tools like HR do is they, for each gene, they will fit this model and this model, and they will, they will use a likelihood ratio test to ascertain which model explains the data better. Do the data better fit the full model or the null model? And, and the p-value that you're getting is from this likelihood ratio test, okay? And because this is um, for count-based data, if you want to test that there is some kind of um, additional variation in count-based data that's coming because of biological factors, you use a negative binomial distribution, which is a type of generalized linear model. So if you use, you know, depending on what uh, genomic assay you use, your model has to make sure to follow the assumptions of those data. Right? So you're not trying to fit lines with your RNA-seq data. So I'll kind of do that. And then you need to correct for multiple tests. So you got to take your adjusted p-value in less than 0.05. And then finally, you evaluate your signal. Okay, so now we are going to go look at a worked example for RNA seq analysis.